Londoners would stroll by a long stretch of tobacco enema kits, which encouraged users to blow smoke up your mate's ass in the event of an emergency. That's a little gay. Hold on. The past. <laughs> ah, hello everybody, welcome back. This video is brought to you by who? His magic spoon, yes! Mmm. 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 I do that with extra passion because it annoys certain people who insist on telling me on Twitter how much it annoys them. Enjoy this bit. You're really gonna love my new mukbang channel. Mukbang? Mukbang? Who gives a bang? Um, Sam, bleep out those swear words because it's not appropriate in a commercial or in the first minute because then I don't make any money from YouTube. Which makes me sad because I'm a good capitalist. A must! Please open the video integration with a shot of the host eating cereal out of a bowl, followed by a personal story. Okay. Well, we've done the bowl bit, let's tell a personal story. What's that? I didn't eat cereal for a long time. You've heard this story before. Because, you know, you go to the store and you're like, oh man, all that cereal looks mega, de mega delicious, but I'm not eight anymore. And I know I'm gonna have like four bowls, and it's like 500 grams of sugar or whatever per bowl. And then the next thing you know, you're morbidly obese because you can't stop eating crunchy nut. I mean, generic cereal that's probably generic, super generic cereal. But then Magic Spoon came along and they were like, yo, Facts Boy, have you heard about Magic Spoon? And I was like, I mean, yes, because we've worked together many times before, honestly. But they were like, look, look at it says it right there on the box. And it says right there, read nutritional values verbatim for legal reasons. And I shall do that, Magic Spoon, because, well, I don't want to get sued. You don't want to get sued. Honestly, I don't think anybody wants to get sued. Who would sue you? I guess, or maybe there's like an advertising authority, probably. <laughs> Zero grams of sugar, four grams of net carbs, 13 grams of protein. Zip per serving, obviously. Zero grams of sugar is, that's what sold me. Like, I don't know much about protein or carbs. I'm not one of these people who's like, yeah, 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 I want a carnivore keto diet. I track my piss with a little stick that I piss on. It's like, okay, Joe Rogan, calm down. <laughs> Steady on old bean. But all I know is like sugar, you don't want too much of that in your life. I mean, unless you're eight, then you could probably chow down all of the bowls of generic, not crunchy nut cornflake cereal that, that you want. With this though, fantastic. Because I mean, yeah, it's just better for you, isn't it? Uh, the chocolate's not actually my favorite flavor. I do like it. It's not my favorite. My favorite's peanut butter. This box is not opened and it's slightly damaged because I've been holding onto it. It's like, don't let it go. Because uh, Magic Spoon haven't sent me any new cereal in a while. Hint, hint, Magic Spoon, hint, hint. And uh, I need more peanut butter flavor. I'm saving this for a rainy day. <laughs> uh, there's other flavors, fruity, sugar. I think that maple waffle one over there is only during sometimes. I'm not supposed to talk about that. But sometimes they have special flavors, yes. To get Magic Spoon's best offer yet, click the link below or go to magicspoon.com forward slash blaze BF and you'll get 20% off. That offer ends on the 29th of November. And if you're watching this after Cyber Monday, the 29th of November, do not worry, you can get $5 off your delicious healthy cereal by going to magicspoon.com forward slash blaze. And now today's video. <laughs> Ah, another day and another episode of Brain Blaze. Yes, yes, this one is the weirdest medical treatments from history. Brought to you by... Well, Danny makes it, I'm gonna read it, and then afterwards, Sam, our wonderful video editor, is gonna add in some of the finest vintage memes that you've possibly ever seen. What? What? I'm just a man! Uh, this is the weirdest medical treatments from history. I believe I said that. I believe I always repeat it, because I never remember, because I just get in that... get in that flow. Weird. What the hell is even that? A fresh breeze. Good start, whistle boy. A fresh breeze from the east sends the rusty old metal sign hanging over the door, spinning it, spinning in creaky irritation. The faded wording on the sign reads, Dr. Callow's modernistic experimental surgery for the sick, the disenchanted, and the, well, nobody can remember what the last word was supposed to be. It's rumored that the songwriter, the sign writer dropped dead from the plague before he could finish the job. Also, I don't feel like I'd go to any doctor who says experimental surgery. Why should I, experimental is not what I want. I just want well-established surgery. I want surgical procedures that have been tried on thousands, hopefully millions of people before me so I don't have to be experimented on. Unless I need to be experimented on because I have some crazy like alien disease that they need to do some experimental thing on and I'm like the first person and I'll be like, well, I guess I gotta go for experimental. But that's an unlikely situation. And to make the oldest joke that has ever been made, you know, it's like practice. Why do they call it practice? Why? You know, shouldn't be practicing anymore. 
Inside the surgery, Dr. Callow checks himself in the mirror, adjusts his cravat, and mentally prepares for another busy day of disease and despair. When he feels ready to face his first patient, he reaches out his hand to buzz his receptionist on the intercom. Wait, are we in the past or in the present? I don't even know. What year is it? But then he suddenly remembers that he's living in the olden days and intercoms hadn't been invented yet. Well, there's the explanation. Why didn't you just read the script, fact boy? Also, the last receptionist died from smallpox and he hasn't had time to find a replacement. Brilliant. <laughs> Shrugging his shoulders, Dr. Callow wants... Also, I don't want to go in any doctor's place where there's been smallpox at any time recently. Or at all. Ever. Although I suppose that would write off most of the world because smallpox was everywhere. Get your vaccines. <laughs> Hey, not against smallpox. I don't think they vaccinate against smallpox anymore because through a miracle of science, vaccination, we got rid of it. Crazy. Shrugging his shoulders, Dr. Callow walks into the war waiting room. It's true that the scene that greets him may have looked a little grim to the untrained eye. The smell of death hangs heavy in the air like a Fray Bento's pie that's been left in the oven for too long. Or just a regular Fray Bento's pie because they're not very good, despite what Danny will tell you. And a couple of patients have already killed over in a corner and are starting to attract the flies. Oh, sh**. <laughs> that smells like ass. But Dr. Callow is an optimistic soul. He knows that he's at the cutting edge of medicine and could prescribe the perfect remedy for just about any ailment thrown in his direction. It's gonna be cocaine, isn't it? Have we made this video before? Possibly. As he scans the room and quickly assesses the health of his victims, sorry, patients, he wonders if any of these people realize just how lucky they are to be living in this wondrous era of medical enlightenment. I know we all look back on the past and we're like, oh my god, it was terrible. Like, they had all these diseases that they couldn't fix. People are definitely going to look back on us in the, in, from the future, like 100 years from now, and be like, really? <laughs> People were still dying from heart disease and cancer? Ah! <laughs> the past was the worst! And we're living here. And it's like, and I think about that sometimes. And I'm like, this f sucks, man. Hello, darkness, my old friends. And I know in the future they're all gonna be like, well, you know, we haven't cured brain diseases yet. And they'll be thinking in a hundred years, people are gonna be laughing that people died of brain diseases that we didn't even know about yet. You just lost your brain privileges. Cause when we all start living to like 150 or whatever, there's gonna be some new disease. Cause before like heart disease and cancer, of course the rates were lower in the past because no one lived long enough to get that sh They'd all be like, what did you die? Oh yeah, you plague malnutrition like all sorts of crazy shit. but like when we get to be really old we're gonna discover all these like weird brain diseases and shit we don't even know about and they're gonna be horrible and people are gonna be like, oh man i can't believe i'm 150 and i can't even think properly anymore and from in the past i'm like that's amazing i hope that happens to me not only, not the ones who've already died obviously he can't perform miracles but as the first patient is, invi is invited into the surgery a reassuring sense of confidence falls over the waiting room Calo knows exactly what he's doing he will cure the sick and we can trust him. He's a doctor. Give me that cocaine, doc! Cocaina. No. Flower. Together in electric dreams. Within the opening 10 minutes of his first appointment, Dr. Callow has paused to run a nice hot bath in his surgery. Not for himself, that might appear a bit antisocial in front of his patients. The bath was for the first visitor who had come to the surgery with the rather delicate problem. The gentleman was suffering from impotence. Ah, yes. Cured by a nice bath. And definitely not Viagra. And so the healing bath was naturally sprinkled with electrodes. Are they going to electrocute this guy? I mean, you could do that at home with a toaster. Uh, and ever since the ancient and ever since ancient times, mankind has managed to come up with a long list of wacky, nonsensical, and profoundly useless treatments for the symptoms of it, for the symptom of erectile dysfunction. But by the 19th century, we thankfully had put all of that stuff behind us after we discovered that newfangled electricity can cure just about anything. <laughs> ah, what we did to his dick. That's a little gay. Hold on. The idea behind this form of electrotherapy is that your unresponsive genitals can be just shocked back into excitement with a good old jolt of that magical electrical stuff. Some doctors would run galvanic baths for their patients in which Epsom salts and bath bubble bombs and rubber ducks were replaced with electrodes which would apparently restore a gentleman's sexual prowess over time. Oh my god the past everybody it took a while as the patient would require a minimum of six sessions <laughs> all paid for other doctors preferred the more direct route they took a big rod full flowing with electrical currents and shoved it right inside the patient's urethra Woo! to provide stirring stimulation Woo -ha 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 -ha! i'm crossing my legs even as i write this oh my god yes that's a little gay hold on 
This method was naturally quite wince-inducing, to put it mildly, and the bad news is that it took more than one session of electrical prodding. Each session would last up to eight horrendous minutes and would be repeated once or twice a week until the condition cleared up. Immediately I'd be like, no, no, no! Doc, I'm fine, I'm hard all the time, I'm hard right now. I'm just super hard, all the time. What? No, it's worked magic, please don't electrocute me again in the bath. Get that thing away from my penis, it's not helping. I mean, it helped completely, it helped completely, please don't hurt me. I'd probably just choose the bath. Of course, it didn't take long for the snake oil salesman to catch wind of this new trend, and the treatments would move out of the surgery as certain dubious companies released their own DIY kit, which you could use in the comfort of your own home. Your home, which is about to become significantly less comfortable because you're electrocuting your penis. Some sold between 1890 and 1920, the new mail order electric belts were worn around the hips and came with a special little strap in which to insert your flaccid penis. Constructed from wires and silver-coated zinc and copper discs, the belts were designed to generate electricity as the discs, fu discs fused with your anxious sweating. Is that even real? Although the true purpose of the devices was never explicitly outlined in the print advertisements, the marketing slogans preyed on the fear of a condition which was widely perceived at the time to be male weakness. Giant balls with the tiny cock. <laughs> The ads often featured flying cherubs alongside the freshly revitalized muscleman, accompanied by the slogan which ran along the lines of Weak men, your prayers have been answered! Only $18! Which back in the day must have been a ton of money. I guess people will spend whatever you want to get that. And I mean, Viagra was mad expensive. I mean, now it's like generic, right? And we've had sponsors in the past where it's like, yeah, they sell generic versions of this. Um, but in the past it was mad expensive. And everyone was like, this is one drug where I'm not going to complain about the price. Keep doing your thing, drug companies! Apparently, tens of thousands of these things were sold in the US alone, with one even making an appearance in the 1906 Sears catalogue. And that's a shame, really, as there was never, single, never a single scrap of evidence that a galvanic bath, an electric rod, or an electric belt ever achieved anything more notable than a regular infliction of intense discomfort. It was later revealed that the current generated from an electric belt barely registered on a galvanometer anyway, and the zinc and copper discs left behind and corrosive salts which caused painful sores. Oh, Apparently, some recent studies in 2016 from San Francisco suggest that there may yet be a medi some medical merit to zapping your private parts with electricity, but I suspect that most of today's patients suffering from this condition caused by a complex mixture of physical and psychological issues would far prefer just to take a little blue wonder pill called Viagra, which was approved by the FDA in 1998. Yes, oh my god, the thing in the penis, just no. The weird penis belt, please no. What's going on? At least that probably doesn't electrocute you. Still. If we think that an electrical prodding and poking is a bit brutal, it's at least a step up from 16th and 17th century France, where impotence was both a crime and grounds for divorce. Holy shit. Suspects, oh, I've heard about this, where they had the trials, where you'd have to try and perform in court, and it's like, bro, bro. Even if I wasn't impotent, and they're taking you to the impotence trial, and they're like, okay, prove to us that you uh, can do your thing. And you'd be like, uh, right now? <laughs> It's not gonna work, mate. I mean, we're in a courtroom. There's loads of people here. It's weird. Suspects have to often had to prove their innocence by getting out their wedding tackle in court and achieving an erection in front of the jury. All rise for Judge Love Truncheon. Butter bob bob. That's some pretty dark stuff. Mummy's medicine. It's not entirely implausible that Dr. Callow may have had some quite alarming ingredients lurking in his surgical cupboards, hiding amongst the perfectly acceptable packets of cocaine tooth drops and jars of heroin cough medicine. Lovely! You might have come across a skeleton selection of medicinal concoctions extracted from an unfortunate human body, including powdered, mummified remains, a couple of livers, some jars of fat, and one or two dried hearts, and a few samples of crushed human skulls. Oh my god. <laughs> it's like, doctors in the past were like actual witch doctors. Although corpse medicine often gets conveniently forgotten in the official proud histories of medicine, it was a pretty popular treatment for all kinds of ailments between the 12th and 19th centuries, and it's a cannibalistic medicine that was largely rooted in weird mystical beliefs rather than anything vaguely resembling scientific study. The ancient Romans were the first to get a taste for blood as they believed that the blood of a fallen gladiator could cure epilepsy. Oh shit, Romans. I mean, you were all, all up to all sorts of crazy shit, so this in no way surprises me. This led to a flourishing new opportunity for entrepreneurial merchants who were willing to sneak around dead gladiators and stock up on lucrative fresh supplies. Holy shit. 
and the 12th century witnessed fresh business interest in Europe from the idea of consuming the remains of the deceased and absorbing a portion of their spirit to help restore vitality and well-being. Egyptian mummies were the connoisseur's choice of medicine for several hundred years. The mummies were ground up and sold as a powder, which could apparently help cure epilepsy, hemorrhaging, bruising, and coughs. Spoiler alert. Didn't work. <laughs> This proved to be a winning business model right up until the 16th century, but it came wrapped with a bundle of problems. Wrapped, mummy, but a bub bub Uh, long term, as there are only so many genuine Egyptian mummies to pass around the dinner table, following a period of stealing for the real deal and smuggling them across to Europe under a shroud of secrecy, some traders resorted to cashing in on fake mummies, which were often prepared from the bodies of lepers, criminals, or even slaves killed specifically for the purpose. Oh my god. That is so intense. It's literally cannibalism. And not just like old mummy cannibalism, but they're killing people and eating their bodies. That's some f***ed up shit, medicine. People in the past were such knobs. That's some pretty dark stuff. It's at this point that many of the wealthy customers lost their appetite for powdered mummy as they realized they were at risk of ingesting the remains of people who had been riddled with disease and plague and virus. I like how that was the problem. It's like, you want to eat this guy to cure your cough? No, 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 he probably had a worse disease. Rather than, maybe we shouldn't be eating people. We shouldn't be eating people. Get him out of here! He's got AIDS! What? Corpse medicine wasn't all about mummies, though. Corpse medicine. Capital C, capital M. Wow. Uh, any old human liver was thought to be a go another good remedy for epilepsy. Smearing human fat all over your limbs apparently helped relieve aching muscles, heal gout, and cure rabies. There's no cure for rabies. How did we not realize that when no one survived? Like rabies, you're symptomatic, you die. It's, the, it's some scary sh Rabies scares the sh out of me. I've got to make an Into, sh into the Shadows video about rabies. Like, it's a new channel that I do, where we just look at horrible shit, And rabies would f***ing rank up there as being horrible. Like, you get rabies, and unless you're vaccinated, uh, you are going to die. Which is crazy, and die horribly. Powdered human skulls were highly recommended for patients suffering from migraines or bleeding. If you were prone to headaches or stomach ulcers, your doctor might rustle up a bottle of medicine containing a mixture of fresh human flesh, blood, and bone. Or if you were feeling more adventurous, you might have been tempted to maintain good health by snacking on fingernails, dried human heart, or three pounds of human brain mixed with a bit of lily and lavender. Three pounds. I don't know exactly what that is in kilograms, but I know it's a lot. Ha! <laughs> Got him. And it was good enough for kings too. In 17th century England, the tipple of choice for King Charles II was a restorative brew which went under the name of King's Drops and consisted of bits of human skull mashed up with alcohol. He was frantically downing the stuff on his deathbed, but it didn't do much good. The, the potion lived on after his death, though, as bottles of King's Drops were sold in England in the 18th century as a remedy for nervous complaints and dysentery. What the f is nervous complaints? Is that just complaining about being nervous? How do we cure that? Human skull. How did people think this was over the the f medicine? Yes, what's wrong with people? For those who couldn't, I mean, to be honest, people still go to like the witch doctor today. Like on my way to work, there's a pharmacy and next door to the pharmacy is a fake pharmacy. You know, one of those like, what does it sell? Tinctures. But they're both in business. So there's enough crazy people going to the tincture shop to buy like Eye of Newt to cure their dysentery or whatever, you know, disease they think they're curing. It's crazy. Actually crazy. People are so stupid. Jokes on you, I'm into that shit! Ah, Simon, why don't you have an open mind? I'll have an open mind when you use the f***ing scientific method. Idiots. For those who couldn't afford such an expensive royal luxury, an alternative course of corpse medicine could be picked up at public executions where the poorer members of the audience would often rush towards the condemned with the covenant to try and stock up on a fresh supply of warm, fresh blood. Although, oh my god, Jesus Christ, I feel like, again, the past was the worst. Yarnum is the home of blood ministration. You need only unravel its mystery. No. Although Corpse Medicine, capital C, capital M, had largely fallen from favor. Flavor. Favor? Flavor? Flavor? Oh, but a uh, and there, by the 18th century, it didn't completely disappear. In 1847, a father from England was advised by his doctor to cure his daughter's epilepsy by serving her with a compound made from the skull of a young woman mixed with dollop of treacle. Which I think is called I think treacle is molasses. Because I was always like, what the f is molasses it came up in a bunch of videos that i was doing i think on today i found out i said like, what the f is molasses what are we talking about so i google it and it turns out we call that treacle 
in the UK. You're welcome, international friends. I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing. The father followed the advice but later reported with disappointment that it hadn't appeared to work. And as late as the 1900s, powdered mummy was still being sold as medicine in a German medical catalog. It might sound like a barbaric and savage practice which medical history would rather brush under the carpet, but fortunately there's brain blades. But bearing in mind that we still kind of cannibalize old human body parts today for organ transplants, albeit in a far more scientifically sensible manner which has nothing to do with mysticism or voodoo, maybe we have history thank for planting those early human recycling concepts that into our scrumptious brains. Yeah, also we're not like, oh yeah, my kidney's not working and that guy's got a kidney. I'll f eat it, won't I? You what? Problem solved. No, we're actually using science and the scientific method and it works. Organ transplants, absolutely brilliant. Big difference. Tongue twister. Here, I'm gonna get my coffee. A few moments later. Here is an old medical treatment which actually works in some cases, but it dramatically missed the point. Some of the most notable names from history have suffered or are still suffering from the anxiety inducing symptoms of a stammer or a stutter. Moses, Charles Darwin, Winston Churchill, Marilyn Monroe, Bruce Willis, Samuel L. Jackson, Joe Biden, Porky Pig. Really? I mean, these guys really did? Impressive. Oh, son of a bit, son of a bit, son of a bit, 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 a gun. <laughs> You thought I was going to say, a uh, son of a bitch, didn't you? <laughs> and tragically, even today, the exact cause is unknown and there's no cure for the disorder. There's no magic blue pill to alleviate all of the symptoms. Stammerers often have to battle through a lifetime of hard work and speech therapy to increase their fluency in conversation. But there's certainly no lack of effort over the centuries in coming up with that elusive cure. Isn't there that movie, The King's Speech, where the guy's like marbles in his mouth or some sh**? Weird. Over the years, it's been speculated that the root cause of stammering include excessive tickling of a child, <laughs> snacking on junk food during breastfeeding, and allowing an infant to look in the mirror. Oh my. My kid's in trouble because I tickle them all the time. I'm sure my wife drank, eats lo loads of junk food, and my kid loves looking in the mirror. Oh no. <laughs> Fortunately, all of that is probably bullshit. That's not my problem. It's yours. And suggested remedies have included regularly drinking water from a snail shell for the rest of your life and hitting a stammerer in the face when the weather is cloudy. Okay, it's a little wonder that we haven't made as much progress as we'd like in this area. As long ago as the 6th century, it was thought that the problem might have something to do with an overly long tongue. Oh my. And during the 1940s, a Prussian surgeon by the name of Johann Friedrich Diefenbach, oh god, is he going to be shortening people's tongues with surgery? Holy sh**. Builds upon this theory to come up with another radical solution. He cut half the tongues out of his stammering patients without anesthetic. Oh my god, it was as brutal as I expected. Don't, don't, don't do, do, do it. Ah, uh, ah, uh, no, no. The practice known as hemiglossectomy involved making an incision cut through the root of the tongue, which Johann claimed would reduce the spasm of the vocal cords. In a way, he was right. It was a temporary cure for stammering, at least. Yeah, because the patients couldn't speak anymore. And that's because after you'd had your half your tongue chopped off, it takes months just to learn how to speak all over again. Holy shit. Quite aside from the unimaginable pain, another big problem with the procedure is that many patients either bled to death or died later from infection. The treatment for stuttering was eventually banned towards the end of the 19th century, although hemiglossectomy is still used today for life-saving procedures for oral cancer. And patients for the modern version of the procedure thankfully receive a general anesthetic before being subjected to the scissors. Can this be considered medical progress? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Good lord, yes. You could say that again. Ah, but a boom boom. Whale meat again. The next patient to shuffle through the door of Dr. Callow's surgery was a regular visitor who complained of pain and swelling in her hands, wrists, and feet. None of Dr. Callow's prescriptions, up to now, had helped relieve this arrest relentless, relentless agony. By this time, but this time Callow had a new trick up his sleeve. He intended to pack his patient off to Australia, where they would be carefully lowered into the rotting carcass of a whale and left to stew in the putrid bubbling stick for approximately 30 hours. What the f is up the. What? No, sir, I don't like it. This is the most elaborate treatment I've ever heard. The word in the new medical journals was that this treatment would alleviate the symptoms of rheumatism for exactly 12 months, but then would have to be repeated after the effects wore off. If this didn't work, then Dr. Callow was jolly well fresh out of ideas. So he's out of ideas, because this is some crazy 
The dead whale treatment first gained public attention towards the back end of the 19th century in a whaling town called Eden near Twofold Bay on the southern coast of Australia. How the f did anyone discover this? Be like, yeah, yeah, fell into a whale for 30 hours and then his arthritis was better. How? <laughs> Ain't nobody got time for that. The whalers would often tow the carcasses back to shore, where the creature could be more conveniently stripped, and this provided ample opportunity for passers-by to jump inside a carcass and take a good nosy around. <laughs> Wonder what's in here? This was the early days before television. Yeah, you bet it was. Nowadays, people will be like, F that. I'm staying at home. I'm looking it up on YouTube." Thank you. The Pall Mall Gazette reported on a peculiar accident in 1896 in which a gentleman suffering from rheumatism had been out on the lash with his mates when he spotted a dead whale on the shore which had been cut open, quite possibly inspired by a few... Excuse me, what are you doing? Quite possibly inspired by a few too many tins of Aussie lager. Probably not Foster's, because Foster's is horrible. And in the, in, in the UK, it was always advertised as like the drink that Australians have that you should be drinking in the summer because it's hot in Australia. And Australians are like, we don't drink that shit, mate. We absolutely don't drink that. My Australian accent is really bad. Throw another shrimp on the barbie. We don't drink that shit, mate. God, it's bad, isn't it? I could work on that. It could be better. Don't do it. Uh, he suddenly felt compelled to jump down the hole after his not fosters. His mates found the heat and the smell so repulsive that they didn't bother trying to launch a rescue attempt. Instead, they just left him there to sleep for several hours. <laughs> that smells like ass. When he finally re-emerged in the rotting whale, the man claimed that he was completely free of pain, of rheumatism, which had plagued him for years, and this led to a new medical trend which lasted all the way up to the First World War. Sufferers of rheumatism would flock to the town of Eden and watch a hole being cut into one of the side of a freshly slaughtered whale. They would then pay money to get lowered into the hole, leaving just their head poking out of the whale so they could smile for souvenir photographs. Several hours later, they would allegedly jump out of the dead whale with a new spring in their step and a new zest for life. The new miracle cure eventually spread to New Zealand, America, and Europe and was documented in credible medical journals of the time. Were there credible medical journals, though? Were there? No. In fact, the real origins of the dead whale treatment date back much further than the drunken dude by the shore. The indigenous people of Twofold Bay were the first to be recorded, lowering themselves into dead whales and smearing themselves with whale fat to cure aches and pains. There are even aboriginal rock carvings in Sydney which appear to depict the dead whale cure in action. But did it really work? No. I'm gonna say like, I mean, this is one of those things where it's like maybe everyone does it and there is something there. But it's like, that no one ever managed to prove it with science. So it's kind of like, no. While some patients claim that it did, although they also backed up a dubious claim that the relief only lasted exactly 12 months. Some believed at the time that there was method to the madness as the heat and gases generated by the decomposing whale served as a sweatbox environment which helped alleviate the symptoms of rheumatism. But there's not much in the way of scientific proof. Surprise, surprise, and the biggest drawback to this treatment is that it's almost impossible to get rid of the stench afterwards, with one critic of the practice saying that you're likely to end up getting prosecuted under the Diseased Animals and Meat Act. Yes. It's gonna smell terrible. Like ass. A patient of the era revealed to the press, for exactly 12 months the pain left me, but it came back worse than ever before. The smell still haunts me. That dead whale has never left me. Holy sh**. No smoke without fire. Are we gonna be blowing smoke up people's asses? Because that's one I know about. The final patient for the day for Dr. Callow had been suffering from various ailments over the last few months, including regular headaches and abdominal cramps. I'm getting abdominal cramps right now, I'm so hungry. And I recorded a business place before this and I stand up and I move around and I'm like, oh, is it lunchtime yet? It's only 11.05, ah! Eat this! <laughs> But Callow was pleased with the patient's, patient's progress so far and was impressed with how closely the patient had been following his recommendations. Dr. Callow reached for one of his many cartons of Lucky Strike cigarettes that had recently been gifted by the kind and considerate tobacco company. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> the past. He told the patient, You really have been doing remarkably well, and I'm pleased with the amount of work that you've been putting in. Credit where credit's due. I'm not here to blow smoke up your ass, but. Butter, or am I? <laughs> Dr. Callow paused and reflected on his words. Actually, no, scrap that. I'm here to quite literally blow smoke up your ass. Take down your pants and bend over. This won't take very long. Although the concept of a tobacco enema was first dreamed up by indigenous people of North America, it was later rediscovered by the medics of the 18th and 19th centuries. <laughs> Who's that? Yeah, 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 that looks like a good idea. Centuries later, he reckoned that there were some serious health benefits to blowing tobacco smoke up a patient's rectum. The smoke was believed to warm the patient from the inside and stimulate respiration, and also help cure colds, headaches, cramps, and even typhoid and cholera. 
Ah. Most practitioners made a simple kit, which consisted of a pair of bellows, a couple of bots of pots of tobacco to burn, and a few rubber rectal tubes. Lovely. But it could turn out to be pretty dangerous for the medics, as they, if they had a lapse in concentration, and actually, actually sucked in rather than blew out. Oh my god. You're not just sucking in their, like, inside smell, but also whatever the f disease is. I mean, not abdominal cramps or maybe abdominal cramps. You can get some digestive, like, bacteria. Brilliant! That might seem unlikely, but it's something that could naturally happen if you were suddenly struck by a coughing fit. And this could result in the surgeon breathing in the lethal rice water stools of the cholera flagellates directly into their own lungs. What's a rice stool? That's weird. An English physician by the name of Richard Mead. He was drunk on Mead, was an early champion of the tobacco enema kit being adopted as a resuscitation tool which could be used to instantly revive any of the unlucky souls who accidentally fell into the River Thames. This was apparently a surprisingly regular occurrence back in the day. The belief was that the nicotine would stimulate the victim's adrenal glands and produce reviving adrenaline. One report from 1746 noted how yet another woman had fallen into the Thames and been dragged out of the water, apparently drowned, but a knowledgeable local fellow had passed by her grieving husband a pipe and instructed him to insert it directly into his wife's rectum and blow as hard as he could muster. And blow me up, the method worked a treat, and the woman was eventually revived. It's interesting to know that Richard Mead was the only other witness to this unlikely miracle, but it was cases such as this which led to the Royal Humane Society of London placing resuscitator kits at regular intervals along the River Thames. So for several decades, Londoners would stroll by a long stretch of tobacco enema kits, which encouraged users to blow smoke up your mate's arse in the event of an emergency. That's a little gay. Hold on. The past. In 1811, the tobacco enema kits had disappeared from the Thames and from surgeries after it was proven that nicotine was toxic to the human heart and ideally should not be anally absorbed. That proved to be a bum deal for Dr. Callow, who had only recently snapped out 10 cheap kits from a dodgy dealer with a limp and a stammer who stank of decomposing whale. If only he could have seen into the future. Yes, this has been an episode of Brain Blaze. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. If you'd like to purchase some merch, you can go to purchasemerch.co. The boy with the blaze is the t-shirt I'm wearing today. Yes, I managed to do that without looking down. You're welcome, world, and thank you for watching. Doc, I'm fine. I'm hard all the time. I'm hard right now. I'm just super hard all the time.